We honor the tremendous history of the African Americans throughout our country, throughout the world, if you really think about it, right? And uh, this story is one of unimaginable sacrifice, hard work, and faith in America. I am very proud now that we have a museum in the National Mall where people can learn about Reverend King, so many other things. Frederick Doug Douglass is an example of somebody who's done an amazing job and is being recognized more and more, I notice. I notice. I notice. I implore all of you here and all of you out there in the world that hold up this man, that his name and his words still have weight. In 1899, Rochester became home to the first monument in the United States to an African-American, Frederick Douglass. It was spearheaded by John Thompson and was originally intended to be a way to honor the service of black soldiers and sailors who served in the Civil War. 124 years later, Mayor Malik Evans and others gathered at the site to not just remember, but to encourage everyone to become change agents in their own communities. Like students and educators at Dr. Walter Walter Cooper Academy, school number 10. African-Americans have been an integral part of history. And I, I, I live by the thing, a people without a historical memory are doomed. Friday evening, students here shared life stories of the black and white abolitionists and suffragists who worked together to overcome slavery, segregation, and racism to build the Douglas statue. Organizers say it's important that students have a role in learning and then sharing what they know about leaders from the past and present. As the nation becomes restless from in racial injustices, statues of historical figures have become a hot topic. A statue of Frederick Douglass was vandalized in Rochester today, and the statue was located in the Maplewood Rose Garden. Police say the statue was taken off its base and moved 50 feet away from where it stood. There was damage to the bottom of the statue as well as on one of the fingers on the left hand. Police say there was no additional graffiti, and the statue, which is owned by the RCTV Media center has been removed from the area to be repaired the investigation is the still investigation ongoing is still ongoing still ongoing still ongoing still ongoing sir you lived in the old days when our people were slaves and in the new times both but it seems like all those rights that we're supposed to have won are being taken away from us. What advice would you have for a young fellow like me who wants all people to live in liberty and justice? Agitate, Martha. Agitate. Agitate. Oseo, oh, beautiful people, you may now order signed copies of my wife and I's newest book at DaneMakeYouThink.com, available in both paperback and hardcover prints. The first 2,500 orders will receive a special gift included with their purchase. Also, be sure to grab your copies of our other five-star rated books at DaneMakeYouThink.com. Wado, thank you for your support. We appreciate you. Frederick Douglass is known to many as an abo or an abolitionist who favors abolishing the practice or institution of capital punishment, better known as slavery. It was said that Frederick Douglass was a formerly enslaved person in the state of Maryland who managed to escape the harsh realities of slavery and headed north to live a better life as a free man. Somehow, he never faced being reprimanded for running away from his slaveholder. But how was this possible? And how did someone who started in this type of position in life become so wealthy? Frederick Douglass published an autobiography called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, in 1845, vaguely explaining escaping slavery at age 20. In 1838, 
Frederick Douglass informs the reader that since he knew how to read and write, he manipulated identification documents and posed as a sailor by allegedly borrowing a sailor suit from someone. Then he boarded a train from Baltimore, Maryland and traveled to the free state of Pennsylvania, where he began to live as a free man. It was said that Frederick Douglass himself published his autobiography in 1845 at 27 and ran away from enslavement at 20, and he recalled his mother's first name and last name, but not his father's name, who was said to be a white man. It was also noted that Frederick Douglass was separated from his mother when he was six, and he recalled her name being Harriet Bailey. He also remembered his first name, two middle names, and his last name at the age of six, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, and that he was born in February in 1818 with two sisters and one brother, all of which did not have middle names. Now, you could be asking, how does a six-year-old remember their full name, their mother's full name, and not their father's name at all? during dreadfully drastic times of his life. I can only tell you that it was said that after he was separated from his mother at six years old, he was able to visit her occasionally, but only as a young child, before her death at the age of 33. Also, it is essential to note that his alleged birth year, 1818, is not official, and neither is his birth month, February. In fact, it was said that he chose his birth date later on in his life, February 14, 1818, because he was able to freely self-determine his birth date and his name, Frederick Douglass, along with whatever story he wanted to tell people about himself. So any parts of his story that sound like a bit of a stretch should be taken with a grain of salt, even if he is deemed a prominent individual of the anti-slavery movement. But it is essential to note that any body of authority can easily influence a child without a mother or father. J. K. <laughs> what in God's name do you think you're doing? You are taking me any hard. You give an, an inch, you will take a mile. You teach that nigga how to read it, you know, he can but forever ruin him to be a slave. 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 Forever ruin Two years after publishing his autobiography, Frederick Douglass created his newspaper, The North Star, in Wafchester, New York, in 1847 at 29. He served as the newspaper's primary writer and editor, expressing his opinions concerning capital punishment also known as slavery, in hopes of persuading readers to join him in demanding the abolishment of slavery and the rise of equality for the people of color in America. The newspaper's motto was, Right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of all of us. The North Star sold for $2 a year per subscription and accumulated 4,000 readers from the United States to Europe to the Caribbean islands. Over the four-year stretch, it was in publication from 1847 to 1851. Frederick Douglass earned $8,000 annually from his newspaper, totaling $32,000 by 1851. Now, you might wonder how a so-called runaway slave could establish, afford, and maintain his own newspaper business without the funds or academic skills necessary to establish and run a business properly. It was said that Frederick Douglass self-taught himself how to do these things, and that he also used funds that he earned from the sale of his book and speaking engagements that he was previously invited to as a guest speaker for anti-slavery public meetings across America to afford the upkeep cost of his newspaper business. When previous historians challenged this side of the story before me, other parts were added to understand better how this portion of the story was possible. It was later said that Frederick Douglass made friends with white people who were also abolitionists and welcomed his point of view. They allegedly donated money to his cause for publishing his newspaper to make more people aware of the abolitionist movement. The name Garrett Smith, who was the wealthiest man in New York State, was added to the mix. 
It was said that Garrett assisted Frederick Douglass with maintaining his newspaper financially, followed by other wealthy white abolitionists who will go unnamed because of the lack of evidence to support these claims that other historians have made in the past. I noticed that many historians have previously claimed that Frederick Douglass was assisted financially by numerous white people over the years without sharing who they are, where this information arose from, or how they came to this conclusion with evidence. Why would it be so difficult for writers of American history, black history, and even Frederick Douglass' story to admit that he was one of the wealthiest men in the United States then? Would this be because of how he earned this money to begin with? For example, some people are familiar with Frederick Douglass as an author, a public speaker, newspaper publisher, printer, and activist, but people are unfamiliar with how he was able to afford a 14-room Victorian house in Washington, D.C. in 1877 that sat on a lot that was about 15 acres of land for $6,700, which was a ton of land and money at that time. Also, I would like for you to think about the currency that was used to purchase his home when the Federal Reserve notes or the dollar bills that we know today were not in use during the time he bought his Victorian house in Southeast Washington, D.C. in what was known as Uniontown in the segregated region of Anacostia. His house will be worth $2 million in today's money. Frederick also built seven additional rooms to his house, making it 21 rooms. He also added a kitchen that was allegedly different for families to have inside their houses during this period. A kitchen with a cast iron stove was a significant indicator of a person's wealth. And that's not all. It was said that Frederick Douglass employed a maid, a butler, and a coachman, which also means that he owned a horse and carriage and had an assistant, Helen, a white lady younger than Frederick. She later became his second wife years after the death of his first wife, Anna, of 44 years. Frederick Douglass was asked to assist and head the Freedman Savings and Trust Company because they were on the verge of facing a financial crisis due to constant pressure from Democrats and their co-conspirators. It was said that since Frederick Douglass was the voice of the colored people at that time, he would draw their attention and possibly encourage them to continue opening up new accounts and bank solely with the Freedman Savings and Trust Company. So the directors of the Freedman Savings and Trust Company moved over to allow Frederick Douglass to become the new head director and take control of operations in 1874. Now, it is essential to note that much misinformation concerning the Freedman Savings and Trust Company and its history lives online for vulnerable people to endure. I am informing you of this due to the multiple false claims that have been made concerning the bank and Frederick Douglass's role in his attempt to save the bank from collapsing. Plenty of claims indicated how the Freedman Savings and Trust Company faced numerous financial challenges due to mismanagement and fraud, causing significant economic losses to its depositors, and that it eventually collapsed in 1874, the same year Frederick Douglass took over operations. Doesn't that sound odd to you? Why would Frederick Douglass agree to become the bank's head director if the banks were already facing an inevitable financial crisis? If this were truthful, wouldn't Frederick Douglass warn people not to bank with the Freedman Savings and Trust Company? At the end of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Freedmen's Bureau Act into law on March 3, 1865, establishing the Freedmen Savings and Trust Company, also known as the Freedmen's Bank. President Lincoln did this to aid all the colored soldiers who fought in the war and their families, and even the newly freed colored men and women emancipated from slavery due to his Proclamation 95 in 1863 into transitional freedom and a financial element. 
It provided land grants, loans, financial advice, and more to more than 70,000 depositors within its 37 branches throughout 17 states, including the newly built headquarters in Washington, D.C. The bank had well over 60 to $70 million in deposits in today's money, which may still be higher than that due to inflation. Republican President Abraham Lincoln did not get a chance to see how successful the Freedman Savings and Trust Company banks became due to being assassinated just five weeks after it was created. When President Lincoln's vice president took over after his assassination, Democrat Andrew Johnson used his newly awarded presidential power and vetoed nearly everything that Lincoln had set up in favor of people of color in America, including but not limited to civil rights, the relief for freedmen, and the Freedmen's Bureau, which of course is the Freedmen's Bank. The U.S. Congress, which the Democrats mainly held at this time, voted to permanently close the Freedmen's Bureau in June of 1872, under the watch of then-Republican President Ulysses S. Grant. The Freedmen Savings and Trust Company remained operational, but was pressured by Congress and other political co-conspirators to be eliminated. The directors and trustees of the bank spent a whopping $260,000 just to construct a beautiful, brand new, grand building in Washington, D.C. that will act as the bank's headquarters in 1874 and is sat adjacent to the U.S. Department of Treasury. Hmm. That sounds as if somebody was attempting to make somebody upset, right? And to add the icing on the cake, Frederick Douglass was brought on board to become the new head director of the Freedman Savings and Trust Company. When he arrived at the new headquarters, Frederick Douglass wrote, the whole thing was beautiful. Again, the whole thing was beautiful. I had read of this bank when I lived in Rochester and had indeed been solicited to become one of its trustees and had reluctantly consented to do so. But when I came to Washington and saw its magnificent brownstone front, its towering height, its perfect appointments, and the fine display it made in the transaction of its business, I felt like the Queen of Sheba when she saw the riches of Solomon that half had not been told to me. Then weeks later, after Frederick Douglass took over operations, it was said he found, quote, rampant corruption within the bank and risky investments across industries being made with depositor savings. In a desperate attempt to stabilize the bank, Douglas invested $10,000 of his personal funds. But sadly, later that year, in June of 1874, the bank failed against the backdrop of the political forces that undermined Reconstruction. This should make you ask questions like, why would the directors and trustees hire Frederick Douglass if they knew he would eventually find corruption within their business? Why would Frederick Douglass invest $10,000 of his personal funds to save the bank if corruption was abroad? Were there any reports directly from the depositors complaining about missing funds or account mismanagement? Did Frederick Douglass allow people to open new accounts and deposit their funds, knowing their business was corrupt? Was it Frederick Douglass's job to save the bank or to ensure it was eliminated? Despite what people may assume, Frederick Douglass and President Abraham Lincoln were never friends nor associates, though they may have had run-ins over public disputes that they had in common concerning civil rights for colored people, equality, and anti-slavery for America. These two men never became acquaintances. It was said that Frederick Douglass was opposed to Abraham Lincoln until he released the Emancipation Proclamation and that Abraham Lincoln was well aware of this. Shortly after the death of Abraham Lincoln, his widow, Mary Todd Lincoln, sent Frederick Douglass one of Abraham Lincoln's old canes as a gift. But this should not be considered a positive gesture from her because people will send gifts to their opposition all the time. 
as an intimidating message or an acknowledgement of their opposition's traits. She chose this cane because it was not ordinary. It carried a strong message by having a gold head shaped like a snake. Frederick was appointed U.S. Marshal by the 19th President of the United States, Rutherford B. Hayes, in 1877. The same year, Frederick purchased his Victorian house in Southeast Washington, D.C. This was considered a prominent federal government position for a so-called colored person because no other colored person has ever held that position, or so we were taught to believe. Recorded accounts of his earnings tell us that Frederick Douglass was making a comfortable salary between ten to $12,000 per year as a U.S. Marshal from 1877 to 1881. Even though this position lasted four years, it is essential to note that Frederick Douglass was already a wealthy man before holding the U.S. Marshal position but was paid handsomely because Republican President Hayes needed Frederick Douglass' assistance with keeping the people of color at bay. While he managed to withdraw federal support for people of color voting and their demands for equality and civil rights, which was surprisingly the total opposite of what Frederick Douglass advocated for over the years. At this time, a U.S. Marshal was a census taker Frederick Douglass was responsible for gathering information on all people of color and relaying it to then-President Rutherford Hayes. This information would include the total number of adults and children in each household and their education, skill sets, and current occupations. This information would help those trying to run a country gain insight and provide future direction for the people of color. Could this be one of the reasons why Frederick Douglass was one of the wealthiest men in the United States then? What other reason could there be for President Lincoln, President Johnson, President Grant, and President Hayes to allegedly give an ear to Frederick Douglass on the topic of colored people? Other voices were prominent in speaking for all colored people, but who gave Frederick Douglass the right or permission to be the voice of all colored people? And just who was he working for? Was he assisting the removal of slavery? Or did his actions provide for the further enslavement of our people? And at what cost? Well, sir, you lived in the old days when our people were slaves. And in the new times, both. But it seems like all those rights that we're supposed to have won are being taken away from us. What advice would you have for a young fellow like me who wants all people to live in liberty and justice? Agitate, Martin. Agitate. Agitate. Agitate, 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 agitate. I'm just here to make you think. 